All right, it is October 17th, and this is week seven of engineering ethics at NJIT. Uh, excellent. I'm going to go ahead and mute Manuel, but you can jump on whenever you want. Uh, good. Uh, all right, let me go ahead and jump into the class. All right, so chat. Yeah. good. So uh, we're on week seven. Um, week seven is uh, not a normal week for assignments. Um, this is probably the least philosophical week uh, for assignments. Um, this week we're going to be looking at ethical codes, and in particular, we're going to be looking at the NSP Code of Ethics. Uh, code of Ethics. It's a, it's a it's a two-page document. It's only two pages. This is the Code of Ethics. Uh, it's made by the NSPE. Um, so we're going to go over that. Uh, your assignment is to read over the Code of Ethics, and not just the NSPE Code of Ethics, but if you go into your textbook in Appendix B in the back of the textbook, um, there are, uh, they have printed up several uh, ethical codes from different ethical uh, engineering societies. The NSP is the National Society of Professional Engineers and it's the most general engineering society, but they also have the ethical code for electrical engineers, chemical engineers, uh, civil engineers. Um, there's an international code for mechanical engineers um, uh, and software engineers. Uh, so all these different engineering domains have their own uh, code of ethics um, that's specific to the kinds of issues that they deal with. Uh, so look over the NSP PE Code of Ethics for this week. Um, look over the Code of Ethics for your particular professional society uh, that's on your career path. Um, your assignment this week is not just to write a general post, uh, but instead what I'd like you to do, and I've talked about this before, but um, what I'd like you to do this week is to go over the Board of Ethical Review case, case files, the case history. Board of Ethical Review has uh, done case analysis going back to the 50s. Um, and uh, so in these cases, they have you know, some facts uh, describing what happens in the case. Um, some questions about who is ethical or what was ethical. It refers to all the different codes of ethics that bear on an evaluation of the case. And then it discusses in detail all these different cases. It relates them to previous cases that it's considered uh, to talk about the differences. Um, and in the end, it gives some ethical conclusion. In this case, it would not be unethical for the engineer A to do whatever. So it gives us some, some uh, uh, result at the end. Uh, so your assignment, yeah, is there a question? Uh, no question, there's just uh, me. Uh, sorry. Let me look at one thing. Ah, here. Okay. Yeah, so I have, I have uh, so I just set it to mute participants on entry, but um, if you have something to say, please interrupt me. Please just jump into the lecture and interrupt me. I'd rather uh, hear you than hear me. All right, so um, yeah, so your, your assignment this week is to pick one of these case studies, um, and there's several decades of case studies to look at, uh, and then to give it a full analysis, um, to explain what happened in the case, uh, to give your own analysis of the case, um, to evaluate whether you think the review board gave a fair analysis, do you think they're being unfair, uh, why are they being unfair, how would you have decided the case differently? Um, I also would like you to uh, analyze the particular ethical codes that come up for review in these discussions. Right, so every one of these, uh, every one of these case studies involves, right, so there's the case itself, there's the questions, and then there's a bunch of codes that are relevant to the case. So I'd also like you to give some discussion of these codes, um, whether you think they're fair, uh, 
uh, how, how you think they apply to the case you're setting. And then uh, also the conclusion. Do you think the conclusion was uh, fairly, uh, uh, fairly decided? Do you think, would you have done the same thing uh, in, in your situation? Uh, if, you were, if you were in their situation? Okay. All right, so uh, your post should be a normal length post, 350 words, uh, analyzing one of these ethical review board cases in detail. Uh, you still must uh, uh, re reply, leave two replies in other students' posts, um, just as normal. Uh, so the, the point is that by the end of this, you should have at least read through three of these case studies and given some consideration. That's the only assignment this week is just to give one of these case studies. Uh, it's not too hard, and we'll, we'll go over the code of ethics uh, and some. Uh, we'll look at some case studies ourselves uh, in the next hour. I just also want to uh, mention that there's an extra credit opportunity. Um, it's made available this week, uh, and it's going to be due on uh, November 11th. Um, what I'd like you to do so the ethical review board case analysis is not that difficult, and so if you have more time, you want to do some more work for this class, you want to catch up on some missing points, for instance. Uh, extra credit assignments are worth 20 points. And what I'm asking you to do is to talk about the ethical considerations specific to your field. So this, a lot of what we're talking about this week is just general engineering ethics. Um, but if, there's, if you're a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer and there's specific uh, ethical issues related to those fields, um, talk about those. Uh, if you're a civil engineer or if you're not an engineer at all, if you're a business major or some other kind of major, um, talk about the specific ethical issues in your domain, how they might differ from the more general eth uh, engineering ethics uh, issues that we've been considering. Um, I've included some resources if you're in biology, uh, uh, civil engineering. Um, I've included a couple of other resources there. Again, look at Appendix B in your textbook. We'll have the code of ethics for all the different engineering societies. Um, if you're uh, a software engineer, you can also do that. Um, Another option uh, for this extra credit assignment um, that I didn't put up on the website, I'll put it up on the website soon, um, is uh, this weekend was a major conference at NYU on the ethics of artificial intelligence. Uh, it was Friday and Saturday uh, this last week. Um, I, I, was, I didn't speak at the conference, but I was in attendance and I asked a lot of questions. Uh, so I'll put a link up to the conference page um, in particular uh, they have all the streams, the video streams uh, during the conference are all available online. You can watch for free. Um, uh, some of these talks are really good. I'll put up some notes about which talks to look for uh, that you might be interested in. Um, but if, if you want to do the, the, the extra credit assignment um, on the ethics of artificial intelligence, so it doesn't just have to be ethics of your field. If you want to do it on the ethics of artificial intelligence and you want to look at some of these, uh, like, uh, these uh, conference talks and talk about them, um, I would also accept that for credit. Um, the extra assignments are due on November 11th, and they're due in the Lesson 15 thread. So if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of Moodle, uh, in Lesson 15, the actual form for Lesson 15 assignments isn't open yet. It opens two weeks before they're due. But the extra credit uh, essays are available. So there's a special form here for extra credit essays. And then the ethics of your field, that's where you want to post it. So you want to just post your essay in this thread and you'll get credit for that. Uh, you don't have, just have to post your essays here, you can also read other people's essays and leave comments and I will give uh, extra credit points for comments left in this forum also. Um, uh, I'll have another assignment that I'll make available later on in the semester, but for right now the assignment is to do uh, the ethics of your field that's due on November 11th, so in two weeks, no, three weeks. Good. Uh, any, any questions about those assignments? Uh, like I said, I was at the um, <coughs> uh, conference all weekend, so I'm a little bit behind on the grading, um, but I'll, I'll catch up that soon. So uh, Taylor asks, uh, do we post the extra credit in the, you, you want to post the extra credit in the extra credit forum. The extra credit forum is in lesson 15. Yeah, no, not as a new discussion. Yeah, go ahead and post the extra, your extra post in the thread, in this same thread. So there should be a bunch of, yeah. Yeah, not a new thread, but in the same, in the same thread. Good.
Are there questions? Uh, if we choose to do the uh, artificial intelligence one, the ethics one, uh, how do we write that? Do we write it with the um, code of ethics like the other ones or just kind of give a review of it? Um, good. Uh, so uh, I will write up a uh, modification to the extra credit assignment that makes it available so you can write on this also. Um, uh, so in, in our class uh, later on in the semester, in weeks 12, 13, and 14, uh, we do artificial intelligence as a unit in the course. So we're going to have some general discussions about artificial intelligence later on. Um, the extra credit assignment would be for uh, watching specific talks at this specific conference. Um, there's a bunch of them. Uh, and, and I'll point you to the ones that I think are good. Um, so uh, what I would like uh, for the extra credit assignment, you would get extra credit uh, for responding to and talking about some of the issues raised in these specific talks. Uh, later on, like I said, uh, in class, we'll have an opportunity to talk about artificial intelligence more generally. But um, if you don't want to talk about your own your own career, uh, or your, your own engineering field. Uh, right now I'm in computer science, science. so I already have, I'm taking uh, computer ethics too, so it's kind of like, you know, I already do a lot of stuff in the computer ethics class they make me take. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, so uh, can, can you ask the question again? Oh, I was saying um, I'm already, I'm in computer science right now, so I'm already, uh, I'm taking computer ethics too, which we talk a lot about that side of it in computer ethics, but the artificial intelligence is something that interests, interests me. Yeah, so if you, if you are planning to do artificial intelligence or some computer science related field, robotics or whatever, uh, uh, if, if you're planning on working on artificial intelligence as a career, then you might want to talk about artificial intelligence a little more generally, and, and that's fine. And like I said, we'll have a lot of opportunity to talk about this stuff in some detail later on in the course. Uh, for the extra credit assignment, though, I would at least like it to be framed in terms of one of the lectures uh, at the conference. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, good. Uh, all right, so let me go ahead and jump into the lesson this week. Um, the Prezi is a little bit short, and it's not completely done. Oh, I actually need to log out of this. Prezi is not completely finished. And it's also a little bit slow because uh, I was using a lot of images. Um, I'll see how this works. Okay, so lesson time, we're going over engineering codes. Uh, and in particular, we're going over the NSP code of ethics. So like I said, it's, NSP code of ethics is only two pages long. It's a very short document. You can read it really quickly. Um, just for some history of the NSPE, if you're not familiar, um, the NSPE is the official uh, professional society for engineers generally. Like I said, there's specific engineering societies for chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, software engineers. Uh, uh, but this is the NSPE is sort of the most general. They operate in all the states and territories. Um, they have a bunch of local chapters. And it's usually the state chapters that coordinate with states to issue licenses. Um, not only to issue licenses, but to talk about the regulations on who gets a license, um, when licenses get revoked, and so on. So the professional societies work very closely with government in order to establish these kinds of rules. Um, the NSP uh, itself uh, has, is uh, charged with uh, representing engineers in the public, and that means interfacing with government, but also the general public. Uh, 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 to represent engineering interests, to represent the profession. Uh, yeah, and like I said, they work closely with regulators, uh, with safety standards, um, in cases where there's a potential ethical violation. If an engineer comes up uh, on criminal charges for an ethical violation or maybe uh, just uh, concern about their ethical behavior, maybe they get their license suspended or revoked or something, um, then the conditions for doing that are usually worked out closely with uh, uh, the professional societies. Usually an expert assigned from the professional societies might stand as you know, a witness in a court trial about whether it's an ethical violation and so on. And the precedent for establishing ethical violations uh, is done through this professional society, in particular sent through the Board of Ethical Review. So uh, the NSP was formed in 1934, and over a decade later uh, was when they first published uh, a code of ethics. So they, they put out like yearly reports, news in the engineering world. And in 1946, uh, uh, along with their reports, they published a code of ethics um, that was structurally the groundwork for the Code of Ethics as it exists today. Uh, after they published the Code of Ethics, though, there were a lot of confusion, uh, 
concern, uh, concerns over different interpretations of certain terms or uh, certain principles. Um, and so in order to try to clarify a lot of these concerns, the board, uh, the NSP established the Board of Ethical Review. The board of Ethical Review consists of seven members. Um, most of them are engineers, professional engineers, um, or uh, people in industry closely related to these technical issues. Um, and their job is to evaluate cases. Um, people present cases where there's some ambiguity or some confusion about the ethical policy, and the Board of Ethical Review provides an official statement from the NSPE uh, establishing some ruling on the case. Um, in the process, they usually give a formal interpretation of the Code of Ethics so that, so that everyone is very clear about what it means and how it applies in these cases. Um, and like I said, they've been uh, doing this kind of ethical review for decades, since the 50s. Uh, and every every year they do a, a, a whole set of these, uh, 10 or 12. Um, and these serve as precedent. So if, if there is a court trial, if if, uh, uh, if you get sued, for instance, on criminal charges or, or whatever, um, in the process of the trial, these cases might come up uh, as establishing what the standards are in the profession or what the expectations are. Do they handle uh, every field of engineering, like every type of engineer? Uh, no, so the NSPE is the general engineering uh, uh, society. If you're a chemical engineer, then you're probably going to be interfacing with the Society for chem Chemical Engineers. Uh, I mean, but what, what cases, I, like they're general for engineers, but so, so what type of engineers would, would be handled by NSPE? Uh, I, you know, I guess I guess this is something that I'm not entirely clear about, which is the relationship between the NSPE and the other um, professional societies. So the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, for instance, yeah, that's a distinct society that's supposed to represent chemical engineers in particular uh, uh, and the specific kinds of practices that go along with them. Um, and I'm not sure what their relationship is with the NSPE. My suspicion is that specific fields of engineering end up being with their specific field, but if they don't fit in any other field, they end up part of the NSPE, but I'm not exactly sure how this works. If anyone has uh, experience working with these professional societies, um, I'd love to read your, uh, read your thoughts about how these, how these professional societies work, whether it's useful to be a member of the professional society, um, whether they always act in your interests. Uh, I will note that if you go through uh, Appendix B, I think this was a quiz question earlier in the semester, um, that in every single case, the very first principle in their code of ethics always has something to do with the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And really that's what these professional societies are uh, primarily concerned with. It's the uh, paramount uh, obligation is to protect the safety of the public. And all of these professional societies tend to agree on these principles. Uh, I, uh, I, I guess one, one way to talk about this is, uh, would there be any conflicts between these different professional societies, code of ethics? Um, and I haven't studied them too closely to know if there are, are any conflicts, but if anyone finds any, I'd be interested to see. Um, the review board doesn't have uh, legal status I mean, uh, or legal standing for uh, 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 for doing anything more than you know, uh, uh, revoking a license from someone who behaved unethically. But they're but they're not uh, cops and they're not judges. The ethical review board is not a, a, a court trial. So when they determine that someone acts unethically, um, that doesn't mean that anyone's been sentenced to prison or anything like that. Um, these, the, the review board is considering mostly hypothetical cases, um, hypothetical cases involving engineer A and engineer B, and firm X and firm Y and so on. Uh, so they're not deciding on real cases that would happen in a, in a court of law. Um, but the point here is just to provide an interpretation of the code of ethics, provide an interpretation of the professional standards, uh, so that um, if these things do come in front of the court of law, we have some documents uh, uh, explaining those standards, explaining how those standards apply. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, so uh, 1954, the Board of Ethical Review was formed um, where they start uh, uh, signing cases. Uh, Ten years later, the Code of Ethics is formally adopted, so it's not just published in their uh, newsletter, but it's formally adopted as uh, part of the standards for the profession in 1964. Uh, since the 60s, uh, the Code of Ethical Review has undergone a lot of revisions, some of them pretty substantial, um, the most important of which 
uh, happened back in the 70s when the NSPE was sued over uh, antitrust laws. So several of the codes of ethics have to do with uh, uh, competitive bidding. And originally there were, there were very uh, tight restrictions on how much an engineer can engage in competitive bidding in order to win contracts. And uh, the US decided that um, these anti-competitive bidding policies were in violation of the rights of engineers, that engineers had the rights to, to enter into competitive bids to try to secure contracts. Um, that it was also in violation of the antitrust laws um, in the United States. So uh, the US won these court battles and the NSP had to revise its uh, code of ethics several times. You can see the, uh, the remnants of these revisions at the, at the end of the code of ethics where they talk about the competitive bidding policies. So it's been revised several times. This isn't a, this is a changing document, um, but it hasn't changed in a long time, almost 10 years. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and start going through this uh, document. I'm not gonna go through everything. I'm certainly not gonna read the whole uh, code of ethics, um, but I wanna just point out some of the interesting things uh, in the code of ethics. Um, I'll go ahead and read the preamble and the fundamental canons because this is supposed to be the core that everything else is built on. And uh, the rest of the document is really just an elaboration of each of these six points in the fundamental canons. Uh, the preamble, preamble in any kind of founding document like this, the preamble is always supposed to um, uh, sort of contextualize, you know, what is this document for? Um, what is the motivation for writing it? What is its goals that it wants to achieve? So here, here's the preamble. The preamble, engineering is an important and learned profession as members of this profession, engineers are expected to exhibit the highest standards of honesty and integrity. Engineering has a direct and vital impact on the quality of life for all people. Accordingly, the services provided by engineers requires honesty, impartiality, fairness, and equity. And we'll see, uh, dedicated to the protection of the health, safety, uh, health, safety, and welfare of the public. Um, engineers must perform under a standard of professional behavior that requires adherence to the highest principles of ethical conduct. And then the canons, which are the main principles, there are six of them. There's some redundancy in these six. So uh, engineers in the fulfillment of their professional duties shall one, hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Two, perform services only in their area of competence. Uh, three, issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. Four, act for each employee or client as a faithful agent or trustee. Five, avoid deceptive acts. And six, conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, and ethically as lawful to do as lawful and lawfully, so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the, of the profession. So like I said, the rest of the Code of Ethics is just elaborating on these six canons. Um, but before we get any further, let's go ahead and think about this for a bit, especially in light of the ethical theories that we've learned. Um, notice that the canons, uh, and in fact a lot of this document, are put in terms of obligations, are put in deontological terms. Um, that you have specific duties that you shall commit to, um, obligations, right? The, the shall, shall, the, the very word shall is a, is a kind of command, it's an imperative. Right, so the framing, the structure of the, docu uh, the document, the canons are deontological, they're a set of rules and obligations that you have to follow. But notice that the rules themselves are virtue ethics, right? They're talking about specific virtues, the need honor, responsibility, uh, your reputation, right out the top, uh, that honesty and integrity, quality of life, right? These are uh, things to do with the optimum, um, things to do with virtue ethics, right? So you have the duty to be virtuous. Um, let me ask you all if you see any consequentialist reasoning. So I just pointed out deontological and virtue ethics reasoning. Do you see any consequentialist reasoning in this document? Or just, just in the preamble or the fundamental canons? I guess number five, avoid deceptive acts. I mean, that could lead to, I guess, high risk and casualties. It, it could, but notice they don't say that, right? They don't, they don't give a yeah. reason why you should avoid, uh, avoid deceptive acts. They just say that you shouldn't. So that's kind of just a deontological claim. Uh, yeah, so it's number one, hold paramount safety welfare for the public, uh, but they don't give you a reason why. I mean, it might just be a duty that you have in general. Uh, right, so consequentialist reasoning is going to say that you have these duties because of some consequences. 
So, uh, uh, I, mean, I think the consequences are probably implied. You know, they don't say outright what the consequences are because the cases would be too specific and depends on the severity. But I think, that, you know, the, the consequences are definitely implied, which which would be a consequentialist viewpoint because you're saying, all right, you know, the outcome of your actions will maybe cause a, a great harm to a great amount of people, especially with number one, like was mentioned in the chats, because it's implied that, you know, if you don't take in number one consideration, you're definitely um, breaking one of the consequentialist law because you're, you're hurting a lot of people. Yeah, um, good. So, so there's an implication that the consequences matter, but uh, the reasoning is important here. So um, if you use consequentialist reasoning and the consequence, if the consequences are what matters, then if you do something that has good consequences, then it's okay. So for instance, if, if you're deceitful, if you're deceptive, but it helps everyone out, you know, it helps you get uh, a business and you know, maybe no one's hurt that bad. Um, if the if the interest here is merely the consequences, then maybe some of these uh, principles can get violated. So so the point here is don't hold the safety and welfare of the public uh, as paramount because it yields the best consequences. The, the point is that you should hold the, the public safety paramount because it's the most important thing to do, not just because it ensures the best consequences, but because it's the it's the primary duty. Um, yeah, you're right. Because because according to consequentialism, you could you could lie if it if it meant that it helped more people than hurt. So that would that would kind of disobey one or canon. So I guess you're right. It's not really too prevalent in here. Yeah. So uh, so I, 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 uh, yeah, that's right. So um, there's some of it is implicit and implied, um, and some of it is hidden in other ways. So there's two places where I see consequential reasoning. You might find more, but one here is in the sixth canon. So that engineers should conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, and ethically, and lawfully, so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the profession. Right? So this so as means that there's a, there's a reason, and the reason is to ensure these consequences for the profession. Um, so uh, that so as, it's an instrumental, it's an instrumental relationship that there's, the reason you do this is for these other things. I mean, in this case, it's for the benefit of the profession, not just personal benefit, but for the benefit of the profession as a whole. Uh, another one, uh, another bit of consequential reasoning is, is right here in the preamble. So it says, engineers have a direct and vital impact on the quality of life for all people. Accordingly, the services provided by engineers require honesty, impartiality, fairness, and equity. Right, so this is, again, is a little bit of consequential reasoning. The accordingly, again, shows an instrumental relationship. These are the consequences that, that we are concerned with, quality of life. So for that reason, to protect those consequences, uh, it's important to have these virtues. Uh, so, so I just wanted to point this out because we've been thinking for the last few weeks about ethical theories, and you can see that in this document, all the ethical theories come into play. The point is not, is one ethical theory right or is the other wrong? Uh, the point is, how do these ethical theories uh, yield the kind of reasoning that we make about um, ethical circumstances? Question? Oh yes, uh, uh, Taylor asks, uh, uh, if two canons contradict, uh, the higher number one takes priority? Yeah, I think that's right. I think it, it goes in uh, decreasing priority. So that the last one, enhancing the profession, um, is the sort of the last concern that you should always think, is it good for the profession? Uh, but the, the primary concern should always be the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Uh, so safety, health, and welfare of the public, as opposed to public-facing virtues, uh, competence virtues, um, honesty, avoiding deceptive acts, these are, these are honesty or integrity virtues. Uh, acting as a faithful client, uh, as a faithful agent for your client or employer. Um, this loyalty virtues, and we've talked a little bit about this also. So all these things come to, come to play, come into play in the Code of Ethics. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's start going through this. So remember, uh, the rest of the Code of Ethics is really just elaborating on each of these fundamental principles. So first one is, that the engineers should hold uh, paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Um, first thing to notice here, so it says, um, if an engineer's judgment is overruled under circumstances that endanger life or property, they shall notify their employer or client or other such authority as may be appropriate. Um, uh, engineers shall not reveal facts, data, and information without prior consent of the client and employer, except as authorized by the law or code. Um, what you should be getting out of this is that the Code of Ethics authorizes whistleblowing. It recognizes that sometimes uh, the safety of the public 
requires that you step outside of uh, your contracts with your employers, your contracts with clients, um, to, to go to a, some third party, some, some other authority. So code of ethics is, is uh, clear right off the bat that um, uh, your, your contracts with your clients are less important than the safety, health, and welfare of the public. And if there's a uh, conflict with this, then the public wins out. I remember reading somewhere else in previous lesson that we did uh, that the um, NSPE doesn't necessarily, it's not going to protect you just because you follow, just because you follow their canons doesn't mean you're protected by the law or by, or by your position in the job. They just suggest that you should do that, but they don't offer you really any protection. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, if you if you decide to whistleblow, you know, mean that you could you could still be fired from your from your job, um, you know, if you decide to whistleblow, even though you might be respected by the professional community, what you did, you're not. They don't necessarily just because you follow the canons doesn't mean you're protected from any legal or, I guess, financial uh, retaliation. Yeah, I mean that's right. Uh, the legal protections for whistleblowers are very sparse. Um, the the ideal here is that the NSPE is supposed to be representing engineers so that if you whistleblow um, by following this code, then at least the NSP has some reason to try to defend you from that position. Um, you know, maybe that won't be successful in a court of law, uh, but it's at least some grounds for thinking that you did the right thing. So the code of ethics authorizes whistleblowing. That doesn't mean that it's legal or that you won't face repercussions, but it's at least, it's at least made explicitly authorized. There's a lot of OSHA protections that the book didn't mention. Yeah, I mean, the book doesn't give you complete, uh, a complete description of all, the, of all the laws and regulations. Um, and especially in, in the uh, Code of Ethics, the Code of Ethics is not the same thing as uh, OSHA regulations. Um, uh, where the OSHA regulations are what's establishing the law. Uh, so, so the code of ethics authorizes whistleblowing. It authorizes that you break a contract um, if it has an impact on the safety, health, and welfare of the public. And we'll look at some cases like this in just a few minutes. You'll find a lot more when you do your own uh, study. Um, I just wanted to note that uh, not only are you responsible for doing the right thing yourself, but you're responsible also for who you associate with. So if you are working with someone that you know to be uh, acting unethically, dishonestly, illegally, um, uh, then you can't work with them anymore, um, that you're obligated by the Code of Ethics to stop uh, working with them, um, and moreover, to let uh, authorities, the proper authorities, know about this unethical or illegal behavior. Uh, if you continue to work with someone that you know is committing unethical behavior, that's also unethical, or you've also committed an, uh, an, uh, an unethical behavior. Uh, if you're known to be working with someone who's dishonest, uh, who's committed fraud, for instance, this is also unethical. Right, so you're not just responsible for your own actions, you're responsible for the actions of the people that you work with. And that means that you're ethically responsible to be working with ethical people. And you find yourself working with unethical people, then you have an ethical obligation to stop working with them and to correct the mistakes. All right, uh, continue, continuing on. Um, engineers are only supposed to perform services in their area of competence. Um, that means that you shouldn't sign off on things that you're not competent to evaluate uh, because that puts your name on the line. Uh, if, uh, if you sign off on something that you're not competent to evaluate, uh, not only will you get trouble for whatever goes wrong, um, but you might also get your, your license revoked. Um, you might also uh, be prevented from practicing engineering at all. Um, so uh, you always need to have expertise when you're uh, performing engineering work, uh, when, you're, when you're signing your name, on any of the engineering, doc engineering documents. Uh, here's a question I have to anybody that's listening, uh, that's familiar with engineering. Um, I, know, I know some engineers, uh, you know, that, that are friends of mine or they work for engineers and they say that there's like companies that hire engineers like like they'll hire a civil engineer and he'll be hired as an electrical engineer. And, and they, they say the reasoning is that 
there's so many classes that you take that are similar to to the different types of engineering that that sometimes you could work in a field that you didn't train for but i find that kind of hard like how could you work as an electrical engineer if you're trained as a civil engineer but apparently it happens in the real world and and that goes in conflict with like this saying that you know you're you're doing work that that you're qualified for uh, i mean civil engineer i don't know how they're qualified for electrical engineering but it, it supposedly it's happening in the real world i don't get it as a mechanical engineer, um, if and as civil engineers, different things like that, if your uh, work is not really complicated, where because a lot of the classes are similar and stuff, so when you go into the world, uh, real world and it's like the low level, I guess entry level, anyone, almost any engineer can pick it up, uh, unless if it's like a specific field meant for only electrical engineers and stuff. So it's not like just because they want electrical engineers doesn't mean other engineers can do it or are not capable of doing it. Okay. Um, yeah, like as a mechanical engineer, you could go, you could do any like engineering tech, uh, technical work, stuff like that. It's very similar like that. It's only when it gets very specific, like obviously like as a mechanical engineer, I don't think I could go for like Exxon and if I have to know chemistry to a really high level, I didn't take classes for that. Mm -hmm. So I can't go do that. Just I have, and uh, the employer, when they're hiring you, they'll see, do you meet the credentials and stuff? Have you uh, heard of these classes? Do you know what this is? If they, and they could tell if you haven't. So it's not like they're picking up, you know, anyone and then throwing them in a major project. I guess for this, um, in this case, the rules really are meant for like, I guess, higher level where it gets very complex and you have to know a certain part about your field. Usually only electrical engineers know or mechanical engineers know. So it depends on the situation. So it's not like very, the risk is not very high at an entry level. And it shouldn't be high because they're like a new person shouldn't have so much responsibility if they're not ready for it. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, a lot of this is supposed to be taken up by the licensing board, right? So you're not supposed to be able to get an engineering license or a chemical engineering license um, um, unless you can actually, you're actually a competent chemical engineer. So, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, you're right. These things happen all the time. These sort of violations of these codes of ethics happens all the time. And uh, uh, people sort of let it happen uh, uh, all the time. And this has to do with our discussion last week of integrity. Um, uh, you know, we, we tell people to follow the codes, but if there's a lot of codes that we're just not following because it's too difficult or too complicated, it's just easier to not follow it. Um, that is, it the problem here is a lack of integrity, and uh, it's not just you know you know maybe maybe that chemical engineer is perfectly fine to handle this mechanical engineering project. It's not it's not such a difficult project. They it's outside of their competence. But the worry is that uh, if we keep ignoring uh, the requirement that people be competent in their field, um, then this sort of degrades the amount of respect we have for the rest of the code of ethics, for the rest of the document. If we can ignore this code, why can't we ignore the other codes? Um, uh, uh, some of the case studies will involve uh, engineers who are competent in one field signing off on projects that are outside of their range of competence. Um, so, so these kinds of cases, uh, uh, they, they exist and they come up fairly regularly. And, and part of the point of the Ethical Review Board is to talk about not just ideal cases and not just the sort of you know uh, Hitler cases, but um, real world cases that engineers can have to uh, deal with uh, in their actual jobs. So, so look for look for good cases. Uh, don't just pick one case study and do it. Look for cases that uh, address questions that you have about these ambiguities. Um, yeah. So I, I just wanted to note here that so uh, although the requirement is that you're competent, uh, that you only sign off on the things that you're competent to evaluate. Um, it's often the case that not only are you assigned to things that are sort of on the edges of your competence, but you might also be seeing, overseeing a very large project where there's a lot of specializations underneath, and maybe some of those specializations you don't know anything about at all. Um, the Code of Ethics says that you can still sign off on this higher level project, uh, but when you do that, you accept responsibility for the whole thing. And what that means is that you have to make sure that competent uh, engineers uh, are handling every stage of the project that you're not personally overseeing. Right? So if there's uh, if there's a big project and there's a chemical engineering part of it, and I'm not a chemical engineer, but I'm overseeing the whole project, then I need to make sure that some competent chemical engineer is overseeing that one part of the project that I don't have, uh, that I don't have oversight. So uh, 
we've already seen in class several times that uh, uh, these issues, these cases where responsibility is diffused among lots of people become very difficult for ethics. Who's really responsible? How do you uh, locate that responsibility with any one person? Um, these are big challenges. Uh, and the code of ethics here doesn't really help us address these challenges, but they just tell you what you need to be watching out for. If you're managing a project, make sure that everything is being overseen by a competent individual. Make sure that you're overseeing things that you're competent to uh, oversee. Um, section three here is about speaking only in an objective and truthful manner. Uh, being honest. Uh, 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 the details here aren't just elaborating what it means to be honest, but there's all sorts of cases that engineers might end up getting involved with um, where honesty becomes uh, an issue. So, so for instance, um, uh, engineers have technical knowledge about uh, technical issues that the general public uh, doesn't know or uh, doesn't appreciate fully. Um, because engineers have technical knowledge, they might be called on occasionally to explain things to the public. Uh, so for instance, uh, you know, if my town is building a bridge and a newspaper might be interested in whether this bridge is a good idea, and they might call you as an engineer to give your, your opinion, you know, is the bridge a good idea? Is it gonna be safe? Uh, is it worth the cost and expense and so on? Um, and you're an engineer, so you have technical information that might help the public understand these issues. And the Code of Ethics makes very clear that you're encouraged to publicly express your opinions. Um, you're an engineer, uh, and that gives you some responsibility to sort of make your knowledge available to the public as they need. So, so you don't, you're not obligated to keep silent. You have, in fact, the exact opposite obligation to share your knowledge with the public. Um, but so if a newspaper calls me about this bridge uh, and I'm just an engineer, you know, I'm an engineer, I work for some firm, but the firm's not dealing with a project or whatever. Uh, and I'm just sort of talking from my technical expertise. That's fine. As long as I'm talking honestly, as long as I'm trying to be as honest as possible, objective as possible, that's fine. But it might also be the case that I'm hired by some firm. You know, the firm wants to build a bridge in this town, and they hire me as an engineer to try to lobby for the firm. So, so they send me to city council meetings where I talk about how, how great the bridge would be for the community. Or I go on, you know, radio news programs to talk to the public about, uh, about the benefits of this bridge. So in this case, I'm a paid spokesperson for the company. Um, and if I'm a paid spokesperson, you might think that I'm going to be a little less critical, a little more... Uh, positive about that bridge uh, than it would be otherwise. So the Code of Ethics says that it's okay to be paid by a party um, when you're issuing statements, as long as you're still telling the truth, um, you can't lie, uh, and you can't hide important issues from the public. So if the bridge is really, really dangerous, then even if you're paid by the company, you have some obligation to talk to the public about those dangers and not just hide them or uh, ignore them. Uh, but the really big thing is that you have to make your uh, interests known. You have to make it known that the company's paying you. You have to say ahead of time that, look, I'm a paid representative for the company. Uh, because saying that is supposed to let people know that there's some influence on your uh, decision, that you're not, to, you're not making the statement as just, an interest, as just an interested member of the public, but you're making this statement as a paid representative of a company. As long as you make that, uh, that business relationship known ahead of time, then you can also speak on behalf of companies. Um, and this gets into the general issue of conflicts of interest. Um, and quite a lot of the code of ethics uh, is set up to deal with uh, cases of conflicts of interest. Uh, the definition I have over here of conflict of interest. Conflict of interest is a set of circumstances that creates a risk that professional judgment or actions uh, regarding a primary interest will be unduly influenced by a secondary interest. Um, and again, the primary interest for uh, professional engineers is the health and safety and welfare of the public. So if any uh, other influence causes you to disregard the health and safety and welfare of the public in favor of some other interest, then that's a conflict of interest. Uh, for, for instance, um, I'm getting paid as a spokesperson to advocate for this bridge um, uh, but imagine that the bridge is really dangerous to the public. 
this becomes a conflict of interest uh, because on the one hand, I want to make the bridge look as uh, good as possible for the business, but on the other hand, there's the safety of the public at, at stake. Um, if I feel that this bridge represents a real risk to the public, then I have an ethical obligation to not uh, 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 do that work for the, for the company to advocate for the bridge. And in general, anytime there's conflicts of um, interest where your professional judgment might be called into question, um, you have an obligation as an engineer to make those influences uh, clear up front. The biggest concern is with uh, government employees. So if I'm an employee of an engineering firm that wants to build a bridge, uh, but I also sit on the city council board, then I'm in a very good position to uh, give my, uh, my bridge building friends a contract to build that bridge in the city. And my obligation as a city council member to respect the, uh, respect the public, respect the safety of the public and the smart business decisions for the public. Uh, these two things are in conflict, right? I have allegiance to my company, but I also have allegiance to the public as a city council member. I mean, in a case like this, uh, it's my obligation to recuse myself from that decision. Uh, I should not decide one way or the other because it looks like my decisions might be unduly influenced. Again, these kinds of conflicts of interest are big ethical problems and they happen all the time. Uh, Spiro Agnew was uh, Nixon's vice president in the, in the 70s. Um, and he also had a bunch of friends in the industry. Um, and uh, for the entire time that he was governor of uh, Maryland and for when he was vice president, he accepted uh, thousands, $100,000 at least of bribe money uh, to reward contracts to his friends. So he had a bunch of friends in the industry and he was awarding these government contracts, huge government contracts to his friends. Uh, these are no bid contracts. Um, so uh, he was basically stealing taxpayer money and giving it to his friends. Uh, co comment? Um, no, no, not now, sorry. Hey, Rob. Um, yeah, so uh, Agnew uh, was issuing these no conflict, uh, no bid contracts. It's a huge conflict of interest. He was caught um, and he was forced to, to resign. He was also disbarred. When he was disbarred, uh, the judge called him morally obtuse. Um, and this is something that's happening right, right at the at top of government. Uh, we can look at uh, Chris Christie also for all sorts of unethical behavior along these lines, accepting you no know, contract bids and giving out handouts to his friends, uh, accepting gifts and so on. Um, the policy here, so uh, act as uh, the, you should act for your employer or client as faithful agents and trustees. Um, right, so uh, uh, if you have conflicts of interest, you have to make them know ahead of time. If you're responsible for some major decision where this conflict of interest uh, has some bearing, then it's your obligation to recuse yourself from that decision and, and, and not make it. Um, one thing I want to emphasize here is that it's not just that you do the right thing, that you're not corrupt, but that you also avoid the appearance of corruption. Right? So not just that you aren't unduly influencing others, but that you also avoid the appearance of unduly influencing others. Um, and this becomes uh, most clear uh, Um, in, in uh, section five of the Code of Ethics, um, where they talk about avoiding deceptive acts. Um, not misrepresenting yourself from brochures, but they, they say uh, uh, part B here. So engineers should not give, should not offer, give, solicit, or receive either directly or indirectly any contribution to influence the award of a contract by a public authority or which may reasonably be construed by the public as having the effect of, or intent of influencing uh, the awarding of a contract. Um, uh, so, for instance, um, Chris Christie uh, endorses Donald Trump for Republican president. Uh, he's one of the first uh, uh, elected officials to do so. Um, and shortly thereafter, he shows up uh, at football games that are owned by uh, major Republican operatives. Um, that's, uh, football games uh, with football teams that are owned by major people in the Republican Party. Um, where it's clear that he, uh, where he's given as gifts these like you know, box seats to these football games, and it's clear that he's getting these gifts in exchange for doing these other things uh, for the party. Um, these kinds of things are very 
Right? So, so even if the gift wasn't the only influence on their decision, the mere appearance of an influence um, is why you should not accept gifts. So the policy, the general policy is that you should never accept a gift from a client, um, especially if you're a government employee. Um, um, I've had to experience this myself. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I was working for the University of California Riverside as a tutor for math um, in, the, in the learning center. I was getting paid an hourly wage to go sit in the learning center and uh, tutor uh, math students. Um, there was one student that I worked with for several years. Uh, he was a computer science major. I helped him on math, on uh, introductory math and introductory computer science. And we worked for several years in a row. Uh, when, he was, when it was time for him to graduate, um, he wanted to thank me. So it was the end of his undergraduate career. Uh, he was never going to take another class again or use me as a tutor again. Uh, but I had worked with him for a long time. It, he wouldn't have passed uh, in any reasonable time without working with me closely. And he wanted to thank me. And so at the end of the uh, session, he um, hands me a $100 uh, gift card to Best Buy. Uh, just as an appreciation of thanks. He wasn't trying to bribe me, uh, uh, make him, give him good grades, uh, or you know, write a paper for him or anything. He just wanted to, as an appreciation, as a, as a gesture of appreciation for the work that we did together to give me this gift. Um, at the time, I hadn't really thought about ethics very much, and I was mostly thinking about games I wanted to buy with that money. Uh, so, I, so I accepted the, uh, the gift, and I didn't really think much of it. And I, I, most of what I thought was that I, I wasn't doing anything wrong, and I, in particular, I wasn't trying to have any undue influence over him or anyone else, especially his grades or anything. It was just a, a token of appreciation. Um, but uh, it turns out that that kind of thing is not legal. Um, it's not legal for the state employee, which I was as a university employee, uh, to accept gifts from students. And the reasoning is this, it's not that I had, uh, it's not that I did anything wrong to the student or that I changed his grades or anything like that. But the worry is something like this. Um, if, if any other student saw me accepting this money from this student, that other student might worry that I'm giving some special consideration, that I'm uh, you know, tutoring them extra hard. Um, and they might worry that they're not getting the same kind of treatment because they're not paying up. Um, even though I hadn't done anything wrong by accepting that gift, the appearance that there might be some uh, unnecessary bias um, in my tutoring is already enough to make the situation unethical. Um, to keep it ethical and to make sure that everyone knows it's ethical, I should have turned down that, that gift. This is, this is a hard thing to do because gift giving is deeply wedded to our social relationships. Uh, when you turn down a gift, it's rude. I mean, that's, it's very hard to do. But, uh, but these are the policies. Yeah, questions? Uh, just personally, I think, Dale, I think you were right to accept the gift. Uh, again, there was no like bad intentions or anything behind it. I think it's just being smart on when accepting the gift and where and stuff. Again, there, it wasn't like you were giving him extra. He had, what's it called? It was play, play, um, fair playgrounds that he came, you tutor him, you tutored everyone else. It's just he chose to come to you to get more tutoring and stuff. Anyone else could have done it, but he, you know, he uh, scheduled it appropriately. He received it more. It's, I don't really see anything wrong with it. I know there is that, um, I guess that temptation for someone else to uh, see you and claim something else, which is untrue. So, in just if I were you, I would kind of give it not in front of everyone, but even there's people that secret, but I wouldn't do it in front of anyone. So, that's just personally. If he gave it to you uh, before you were done tutoring, then I think that would definitely maybe imply some wrongdoing. But afterwards, like, he has nothing to gain by it. You didn't know, you did the work without knowing he was going to reward you in some way. But if he gave it to you before tutoring, he said, hey, you know, I hope that we could, I hope you'd be a good tutor and everything. Here's something to maybe uh, help you out, you know, encourage you to be a good tutor, then that's definitely like a bribe, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, these are both very good comments. Um, uh, I, I want to emphasize one more time that, that the, the worry here is not just that you did anything wrong by, or that I did anything wrong by accepting that gift, um, but just that it could appear that I did something. So, like, if, if you're in a class, you know, the, and you're struggling in the class, you know, you're, you're getting a, you're barely getting a, a D, and you're working really hard trying to do really well in the class. I mean, you see some other kid in the class who has an A in the class and is doing really well. We also see them every day after class, you know, uh, 
giving gifts to the teacher, giving an apple to the teacher, and then like spending a lot of time in the teacher's office hours, and they have an A and you have an, a D, um, even if the teacher isn't doing anything really wrong, uh, you, you might, just, just the appearance that there's some special relationship that teacher has with that other student, um, and that it might have an impact on their grades, uh, just the appearance of wrongdoing is enough. So as a teacher, I have the obligation not just to do the right thing to my students, but to make sure that it appears to all the students that I'm doing the right thing. This is, this is a higher sort of moral standard, not just that you do the right thing, but that you appear to do the right thing. And the reasoning in the Code of Ethics is that this higher standard is important because you also have obligations not just to your own self uh, and not just to the public, but also to the profession. Right? If, you're, if it looks like you're uh, acting shady, then that might compromise the integrity of the profession as a whole. The, uh, gift giving is really hard. Uh, someone asked about politicians, uh, professional code of ethics for politicians, um, and there's really no such thing. And in fact, the law in New Jersey is that the uh, the governor can receive personal gifts in certain circumstances. So uh, they're not even bound to the same uh, ethical laws. Uh, so, so another place this comes up in uh, everyday business practice outside of the engineering field um, is in uh, medical ethics. So it's very common for a doctor to get gifts from the pharmaceutical industry because the pharmaceutical industry wants the doctor to be prescribing their pills so they get paid and so doctors will often receive like receive like gift ba baskets from the pharmaceutical industry and it might have you know an explanation uh, brochures on on the drug and you know maybe some free samples of the drug but also have a bunch of other things like coffee cups and pens and notepads and uh, golf trips and stuff like that uh, and it, right, so uh, if the doctor is receiving these gifts from the industry and then uh, prescribing a lot of the medication, you might think that there's an unnecessary influence, that maybe maybe all those patients didn't re really need that medication and the doctor is over-prescribing because of this influence from the, from the company. Um, uh, in order to avoid even the appearance of such wrongdoing, uh, the ethical thing here to do is to not accept the gifts at all. But of course, doctors accept these kinds of gifts all the time, and it's kind of a big problem uh, how, uh, how corrupt the pharmaceutical industry, or how easy it is for the pharmaceutical industry to corrupt uh, doctors' practices. Professor, just to cut in, how about, uh, for, let's say for our levels and stuff, I'm assuming that, oh, okay, maybe in the next, let's say, three to five years, all of us as students are gonna be looking for jobs and stuff. Some students will get jobs based on not on their ability or skills, but on who they know and stuff. And that might be a, as much as it seems, it really is an unfair advantage, but it is still fair in the way that a, it's who you know and stuff. And that's how most people get jobs and stuff. Ethical wise, it, you could put that into question, but people still get results and stuff. So I'm not saying whether, well, it is having that mindset of whether it's right and wrong, but even if you're right and you still know somebody and they help you and you do what they say and you get the job, I mean, I still see it as right that they had an opportunity, they took the opportunity and stuff. They didn't say, oh, well, to make it fair for everyone, let me just be unselfish and, you know, not accept this job because I'm. there's different reasons for it, but going on that, so. Uh, good. Um, uh, I don't think there's anything in the code of ethics here that says that people can't give their friends jobs or even, you know, even that I, I can't award contracts only to my friends. Um, uh, the, the, the challenge that the code of ethics is really concerned with is about government contracts, uh, right? So if I, if I have a business and I want to hire whoever, I want to hire my brother or whatever, that's fine. If I want to only give business to my friends in the industry, that's also fine. Um, but if I'm a government employee, it's a little bit different because I'm not just representing my own interests, I'm representing the public interests. So if I'm a government employee and I'm only giving jobs to my friends, well, you might think that that's not, uh, that's not the same. And it's not, just, it's not that giving jobs to your friends is unethical, but it's that when it's in a public context, if it's a government context, um, there's other considerations that take precedence, public interests. Um, but uh, but this isn't just about giving uh, jobs to your friends. It's sort of about giving gifts in order to influence behavior. Um, Can gifts mean opportunities? Uh, hmm. That's an interesting question. 
Personally, I would think yes, but you know. That, I mean, that's, it's an interesting question. I, I know for a fact that some of the code of ethics uh, cases that they study are about gift giving, um, and when, when it's appropriate or not to be giving gifts. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so there's some cases, 81.4 is a gift giving case. Um, where, where they consider some specific case where an engineer receives gifts, maybe at holidays or whatever, um, and they go through, is it ethical to receive gifts in this way? Um, there's a lot of discussion about this. Uh, gift giving is, a, is, is one of the uh, uh, tricky cases in these professional ethics situations. Um, just as contrast, uh, my, my girlfriend works as a clinical psychologist and she has clients that she sees in a therapy context. Um, sometimes therapy clients give psychologists gifts um, and there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of trouble with this. So you don't want to have too personal a relationship with your client uh, if you're a psychologist. And so managing, uh, keeping an appropriate professional distance between you and your clients is important. Um, on the other hand, uh, sometimes these clients have uh, mental issues that make rejection or uh, that make rejection difficult to deal with. So, uh, uh, you know, if, if it's our last session, she gives me a gift as a as a thank you note uh, before before I, uh, and, and I'm never going to see her again as a as as her therapist. Um, maybe it's better to just accept the gift and not cause any hard, hard feelings, n not sort of insult her. Uh, because, you know, maybe if I insult her and she's suicidal, it can you know, put her life at risk or something like that. So in, in this kind of ethical, uh, in this kind of psychological context, uh, uh, medical health context, um, uh, the ethical considerations maybe are slightly different. But, but the idea is that no one's, uh, you're not saving lives by taking gifts. Um, uh, so, so it's a little bit easier in, in this context to say that maybe you shouldn't uh, shouldn't be taking gifts. All right. uh, let me let me look at the code of ethics here. Um, we've gone through most of this already. Shall avoid deceptive acts. Yeah, so there's a bunch of obligations that you have uh, to talk, uh, to, to not lie, to not distort truth, um, to serve the public interest. Uh, yeah, that you do the job that you say you're going to do, that you don't um, double charge people for jobs, or if you're doing one job and you know a lot of people want you to do that job, you don't charge them all for that same job unless you let them all know in advance what you're doing. Give people credit who do the work and so on. Uh, so uh, I'll let you go ahead and explore the rest of this for yourself, the rest of the code of ethics for yourself and find um, interesting cases, uh, if there's, uh, the way that I would suggest that you do this for your assignment is to first look at the code of ethics and read through it and find things that you think are questionable or things that you don't exactly understand or know how to interpret, and then use those to go find cases that deal with those particular codes of ethics and see how they interpret them. Um, let's go ahead and look at some cases, see what you think. Um, so I have two cases up here that I want to look at. Uh, this, this first case is uh, case 89-2, declining employment after acceptance. So this has to do with the hiring process. I'll go ahead and read the case uh, out loud. So uh, the city of Orion began a recruitment process in the first week of January for a city engineer public works director. The recruitment was necessitated by the impending retirement of the former city engineer, public works director in May. 
The city wanted to have a new employee on board for orientation and training prior to the incumbent leaving. Uh, the city received a great number of applications and went through the laborious task of screening for finalists. During the screening period, Engineer A was in the area and requested an appointment to gather more information regarding the position. The appointment was granted and Engineer A was given information regarding the position, the city, the housing, schools, etc. Engineer expressed a strong interest in the position and he stated that he had friends living nearby. He also stated that he was familiar with the area. Um, Engineer A was one of four finalists interviewed for the position uh, during the first week of March and was selected as the best qualified applicant. An offer for employment was extended to Engineer A on March 10th, which he accepted. And then Engineer, Engineer A started employment. Uh, Engineer A agreed to start employment on or before April 10th. So uh, retirement was happening in May. They hired him in March. And he agreed to start work by April 10th. Uh, but during the period from March 15th to April 10th, several phone conversations were held with Engineer A, during which he expressed some doubt as, as to his ability to start on April 10th due to his obligations to his current employer and for personal reasons. Engineer, Engineer A was advised by the city that he would be permitted to return to his former employer for meetings to satisfy his employment obligations. Engineer A was also advised by the city that if he was hesitant about his employment for personal reasons, the city could understand, the city could understand it, but uh, it would appreciate a decision soon so that it could begin a new recruitment process. Each time this was discussed, Engineer A stated that he wanted the position and that he would be there no later than April 10th. On April 5th, Engineer A advised the city that he could not start on April 10th, but that he could start on April 24th. Uh, Engineer A assured the city that, the firm, that this was a firm commitment, but then on April 23rd, Engineer A advised the city that he could not take the position. So the question, was this ethical? Was this an ethical way to treat the city? Anyone have any comments before we look through the discussion? I mean, absolutely not. I mean, that's kind of a, a jerk thing to do. I mean, they, they were real flexible with him. Seemed like, you know, like be well to give him a little bit of flexibility. And he just, you know, he was just like kind of like waiting on silence for something better to come along. It's like it's like when somebody asks you to, to hang out and then you're like, sure, you, you say, yeah, let's, let's, let's hang out. And then they find something better to do and they leave you hang. It's like flat, you know, they kind of like flat left them. He used to say, "Yes, yeah, so I don't. I don't think that's right for him to do." Uh, I'm saying that I do agree with that. There's also another case where this engineer or worker might be valuable. Where other, I mean, this job may really want him and want him to start early, but he's like, you know what? If something else comes in. This job, I might know if I commit to this job, I have to at least stay here for five to 10 years due to the way this job works. I'm just bringing in different factors in. So there's different, that might be a personal reason why he may know, hey, I don't wanna stay here for maybe five years, but no more, but they make you stay for seven and 10 years. So let me see if I can find something else before I lock into this job. And I need, so that's why he may need, uh, need more time. So. Yeah, so that's very good. And in fact, um, the if you read through the case study here, the review board is very sensitive to the fact that making a decision to move towns, to move jobs, it's a very difficult decision and it'll take some time. And you have to factor into a lot of things, how long you have to stay there, family considerations, right? all these kinds of issues you need to factor into the, to making the decision. And it's a hard decision to make. Um, so there should be some latitude that the uh, uh, employee has, or the potential employee, for having some time to make these decisions. And the board recognizes that right off the bat. Uh, oh, uh, Edward, um, I didn't see this earlier. Uh, Edward posted a, from the NSP um, about who falls under the umbrella of the NSP. It says, no matter what your discipline, geographic location, or career stage, NSP offers a membership option tailored, uh, membership option tailored made for your needs. Anyone, uh, open to anyone holding a valid license or certificate of registration as a professional engineer, engineer in training, or defined under the laws of any other country. So anyone can be a member, of, anyone who's an engineer or an engineer in training can be a member of the NSP um, or the other professional societies. Good, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so the review board uh, understands well that these are hard decisions um, and uh, that a bunch of different factors have to be taken into account. 
uh, you guys have put a lot of work into making this decision. Yeah, either way, I, I'm still not buying it. I mean, uh, you know, if you if you if you take the position and you're 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 leading them on, saying that oh, I'm interested and it's a firm it's a firm date that I should you know I should be able to take it by then, like because they they chose him or her over somebody else, and that other person now has moved on, and they might have lost the option to get somebody else at his second qualify for the job. So um, I think even if, if it was a huge inconvenience to him or her as the engineer. Once you commit, I, I think you kind of you kind of have to go with it at least, you know, and stay in the position for a year or two. Um, even if you have to move, otherwise you have to tell them right up front, like, listen, I don't know. I'm gonna need much more time to decide if you're willing to work with me. Then that'd be great. But if not, you know, I expect you to to move on to the next candidate. But um, you know, I just have to see if I can move my family. You, know, you have to be open with them and let them know, like, it's a big decision for me. And you know, there's no reason why he couldn't communicate that to them and say, hey. I need a bigger deadline so I could see if I could work everything out. And my wife can move and all of that. But he, he he led them on, you know, and basically implied that he was, he was going to take the position, just had to work out some stuff. Yeah, and uh, we're not told why he did any of these things. Um, and you maybe there's a legitimate reason that he needed, you know, maybe there was some family emergency that uh, changed. Um, but... Uh, it's also the case that you use these kinds of job offers to try to leverage more from your current, you know, this other company offered me this much, and so maybe you'll give me a raise so I don't have to move or whatever. And if the engineer was doing something like that, trying to use this job offer to leverage for a better job offer, then that's, then that's uh, definitely an ethical. It's definitely sort of using the, uh, the, the city uh, for, their own, for their own gain. Now, uh, the ethical review board here, it's, it, it acknowledges that this is a hard decision and that the employee needs some time to make that decision. Um, it also, uh, I just want to note this, um, uh, that they also recognize that sometimes people slightly mislead um, when they uh, uh, give a, an application for a job, that the, that the application for the job isn't always 100% truthful, that it tends to uh, emphasize your strengths and downplay your weaknesses. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, the board thinks. I mean, you shouldn't lie on your resume. Lying would be bad. But focusing on your strengths and downplaying your weaknesses is something that everyone's going to do on their applications. Um, so uh, the board not only recognizes that there's some uh, lat latitude in the decision making, but there's also some degree of latitude in uh, uh, in how you represent yourself to the company uh, in this application process. So that's a, a, a wide range of latitude. They're uh, giving a lot of latitude here. But all of that said, um, they still find that engineers A's actions were not justifiable, um, provided less than full disclosure. Uh, uh, he, he was given ample opportunity to make his intentions known and he failed to do so on a number of occasions. Uh, they were strung along, the city was strung along. So uh, for this reason, they conclude it was unethical for the engineer to engage the city in this manner. Uh, so it looks pretty straightforward, and um, uh, I, I will say that not all of these cases are of ethical violations. Sometimes it's of suspicions of ethical violations, and the board finds that, in fact, no, eth no ethical violation has occurred. So these aren't all negative cases. In some cases, these are cases where uh, the engineer did the right thing. Let me go ahead and show one more case, unless there's any questions about that case. Let me go ahead and go through one more before we finish here. Yeah, okay, so this, another case. Uh, these, cases are, uh, these cases are not supposed to be surprising or very challenging, uh, but they're just supposed to give you, uh, they're supposed to give you some insight into how the Ethical Review Board is thinking about these cases, how they're thinking about the codes of ethics, and how they apply in concrete situations. Um, so this is a case on um, public welfare uh, regarding hazardous waste. Um, technician A is a field technician employed by a consulting, firm, uh, consulting environmental engineering firm. At the direction of a supervisor, engineer B, technician A samples the contents of drums located on the property uh, of a client. Um, based on te technician A's past experience, he's of the opinion the analysis of the sample would most likely determine that the drum contents would be classified as, as hazardous waste. If the material is hazardous waste, technician A knows that certain steps would have to legally be taken to transport and properly dispose of the drum, including notifying property 
uh, proper federal and state authorities. Technician A asks his supervisor about what to do with the samples. Uh, engineer B tells technician A only to document the existence of the samples, but not to test them. Engineer A is then told by engineer B, or sorry, technician A is then told by engineer B that since the client does other business with the firm, engineer B will tell the client where the drums are located, but will do nothing else. Thereafter, engineer B informs the clients of the presence of the drums containing questionable, but not hazardous material, uh, and suggests that they be removed. The client contacts another firm and has the material removed. Uh, uh, but this material is not removed by the uh, proper procedures for disposing of hazardous waste. To the question, is it ethical for engineer B to merely inform the client of the presence of the drums and suggest that they be removed, or should the engineer B have, told, have done something more, run the tests, tell them that it's hazardous waste, or whatever? Did engineer B have an ethical obligation to take further action? Uh, what do we think? Thoughts, comments? Uh, engineer B did have a responsibility of telling them or having it tested as, material, um, as a hazard waste. Um, if anything happens, I think he, what's it called? They are liable basically for that safety of the clients in that manner. Uh, since they are going to be interacting with it, so. I mean, you know, I definitely feel like um, he was just uh, promoting his own business interests over the, the interests of the public. So, it def, you know, if you're using utilitarian or consequentialism, he, he, he definitely violated that because he's promoting his own financial gains of his company over the potential. I mean, that guy could have dumped it anywhere. He could dump it on a waterway or next to a waterway. Who, who knows how he disposed of it? Yeah. Good. Uh, these are all good comments. Um, one of the tricky things about this case is that technician A, so they don't actually know that it's hazardous waste. And moreover, technician A isn't actually uh, the person responsible for identifying it as hazardous waste. Um, technician A has some past experience, but maybe that experience is unreliable. We don't know for certain that this stuff is dangerous. Um, the important thing here is that merely not knowing if it's dangerous isn't enough to do anything you want. The mere suspicion that there's some danger is enough to warrant taking these further, further actions. Um, so uh, in, the, in the case study itself, it spends a lot, a lot of time talking about another case, um, 89.7. So let me, let me tell you about the details of this case. So this is a, uh, so an engineer goes to this case, uh, to this uh, apartment building to te test its structural integrity. Uh, under the terms of the agreement with the client, the structural report uh, written by the engineer was to remain confidential, so there was a confidentiality agreement. Um, in, in addition, the client made clear to the engineer that the building was being sold as is, and the client was not planning on taking any remedial action to repair or renovate any system within the building. Um, the engineer performed several structural tests in the building and determined that the building was structurally sound. However, during the course of the providing the services, the client confided in the engineer that the building contained deficiencies in the electrical and mechanical systems, uh, which violated applicable uh, codes and standards. Um, while the engineer was not himself an in, uh, electrical or mechanical engineer, he did realize that those deficiencies would cause, uh, could cause injury to the occupants of the building and so informed the client. Um, in the uh, reports, the engineer made brief, uh, brief mention of the conversation to the client concerning the deficiencies, but uh, uh, in view of the terms of the agreement, the engineer did not report the safety violations to any third parties or to any authorities. Um, so in this case, um, they, uh, the engineer didn't even, uh, again, the engineer didn't run the test, uh, but in this case, the engineer wasn't even uh, competent to evaluate this thing, right? So the engineer was a structure, evaluating these structural things and wasn't an electrical or mechanical engineer, didn't look at any of the electrical or mechanical issues and didn't evaluate any of that. So, uh, so the person who has suspicions that these things might be wrong um, wasn't himself a trained professional who did the analysis of those positions. They just had a hunch, right? They heard the the client talking, the client could have been lying or misrepresenting. The engineer doesn't really know how bad the problem is from just what the client said. But just because the client said something at all, just because there was a uh, impression that something might be dangerous, the board finds in this case that the engineer acted unethically by not uh, uh, revealing this information to third parties, that the engineer had an ethical obligation uh, to uh, force the issue Yes, yeah, so the board says the engineer did not force the issue, but instead went along without dissent or comment. If the engineer's ethical concerns were real, the engineer should have insisted that the client take appropriate action and refuse to continue work on the project. So if I'm doing structural analysis for this building 
And I know that there's ethical, electrical and mechanical failures in the building that put the tenants at risk. Then I have an obligation either to tell uh, the owner that something needs to be done, and if the owner's not gonna do anything, to let other authorities know that something needs to be done. Uh, or uh, uh, just stop working on the project altogether, that I, I'm no longer going to continue working on the project myself because the, the project's uh, unsafe. Um, and that's even when you don't know for certain that it's unsafe, even when you haven't done the tests for certain, even when you're not even a competent, uh, in a position to competently assess whether this stuff is dangerous. The fact that there's a suspicion that it might be dangerous is enough to warrant uh, going to a third party. Um, and, and that's what uh, they say uh, for the case, for the, for the main case here. Engineer B consciously and firmly took actions that could cause serious environmental dangers to workers in the public, also in violation of various uh, environmental laws and regulations. Under the facts, it appears that Engineer B's primary concern was not so much maintaining the client's confidentiality as it was maintaining good business relationships with the client. I mean, that means that your priority of uh, responsibilities is, is reversed. Comments? Uh, yeah, I was just say, um, this, this one, I don't know, it seems, I understand it, but it seems a little hard on the engineer because the, the client who, who informed him of the possible you know the decay of the electromechanical equipment I mean he, he might have had his own motive of like just trying to get newer stuff in his building or you know just, just trying to get somebody to say oh yeah this stuff's crap so I can upgrade it and the stuff might actually not be that I mean the guy wasn't qualified to make a, an assessment you know he couldn't and he, he told the people he was working for I mean it should be uh it should be enforced by the state that they do that they go in there and do a regular inspection of the building. Not he's just a private contractor who is there to check 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 the structure. He doesn't. It's not his job to. I, mean, I don't think it's his job to take. You know, there could be some guy in the street say, "Hey, this building's crap." Like it wasn't a qualified person telling him anything. You know, it was just somebody in passing. Like, oh yeah, the, you know the the air conditioning units and stuff is bad or whatever. Electrical systems are bad. But you know, that's just in passing. It wasn't like an official statement. I don't think you know the guy made it to him. Yeah, um, like again, he was only hired for one specific thing. Uh, he knew that other thing, the electrical and mechanical, is not his. He could say it is his uh, special. It's not his specialty officially. He may know of it, but he's not licensed under that um, those services. So he could mention that in his comments, but he's like structure wise, it's safe, but you may also want to take a look at this. And I can't, and from that, he can't go any further on because he doesn't, he's not um, licensed to give out that information. Yeah, and there's also this confidentiality agreement with the, with the, with the owner. Uh, so, so he's contractually obligated to not say what he finds. Um, to compare as if you were like, a, let's say a, a doctor and you're a heart surgeon and you, know, you check out the guy's heart came in and his heart was really good. But then the guy tells you, oh, you know, well, my stomach's kind of, my stomach's kind of bothering me. And you just say, okay, well, I don't really handle that sort of body, but you might want to go to a gastroenterologist, whatever. And then you don't follow up with, make sure the guy went. It's like, is that doctor now responsible? Because, you know, it's not his specialty. You know, he checked out the guy's heart was good, but, I mean, you know, he doesn't know. It's just the guy saying he had a stomach ache. It could be cancer, it could be nothing. I don't think the doctor should be held responsible that he didn't follow up with the guy to make sure he went or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a really good uh, example. Um, what, what, I mean, so you might, you might think that in that case, the doctor, uh, fall, uh, his obligation was just to make a recommendation that he go see a specialist. And once he made the recommendation that he go see a specialist, that was the end of his responsibilities. And if the guy doesn't follow up, then it's on him. But... Um, but, but I, I, I guess I wanted to put this in context of the um, priority of these canons. So, so the first canon is that you must hold the safety, health, and welfare of the public paramount. And the second canon is that you only act in your area of competence. And the idea is that um, if you think the threat to the health, safety, and welfare of the public is high enough, then maybe you should uh, speak out even outside of your area of competence. Right? That the health, safety, and welfare of the public takes precedence over that. So. The structural engineer, uh, he's not an electrical engineer, but if he has reason to believe that the electrical engineer is uh, puts the public at risk 
then even though it's not his own area of competence, he has at least some obligation to say something about it. Now, now maybe that's not, you know, maybe you tell the owner, uh, maybe you tell the owner to fix it, and that's one thing. Um, but, uh, uh, but maybe the obligation goes beyond that to tell um, the police or some other, you know, maybe tell the residents of the building that their building could set on fire at any moment. Let's say that this, he, uh, the uh, guy hired two engineers and hired, the first one was the electrical and mechanical specialist. And they said that there was nothing wrong with the um, wires. And then this engineer comes in, he said there's nothing wrong with the structure, but I would look at the electrical and mechanical, but the owner says, oh, I already had that done. Then in that case, as an engineer, it's like, as long as some, another engineer, a licensed engineer looked at that, then that's on your own then. It's your responsibility now. And you gave your comment, you gave, you're holding up to the first cannon, and apparently it's safe, and it's already legally signed off and stuff. So then out of that, you have, you have nothing to, um, you're, you're no longer under any responsibility under that. Yeah, that's good. And, and uh, you, uh, you might think that someone who raises suspicions unnecessarily, like uh, keeps saying that things are unsafe when in fact they are safe. Um, they're trying to get money or something. Like yeah, that. um, that's also a way of being deceptive. Like, uh, uh, so, so that would also be a bad thing. Um, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys are enjoying these cases and have, have stuff to say about these cases. Uh, my, my first class this morning did not go so well. They just had nothing to say. Um, the uh, word, word for the week is canon. Um, let me go back to the fundamental cans. Yeah, so fundamental cans. Uh, that'll be the canon will be the secret word for today. I'll go ahead and put that on the uh, presentation so that it's very clear. Um, uh, that's all I wanted to say for today. So uh, you have to do your assignment. You still have to do uh, your uh, write-up and then two replies so that you read other cases and you talk about these cases in some detail. Uh, and then there's the extra credit assignment. I also wanted to mention that uh, this uh, uh, Thursday, um, during my live classes, I will be talking about ants. So uh, I will have basically talked about all the fundamental canon stuff that I want to talk about on Tuesday and on Thursday. Either either canon or canons is fine. Can canon will be the word, but uh, on, on Thursday I'm going to talk about ants. I'm going to talk about ant colonies, the integrity of ant colonies. Uh, I will argue that ants are the most sophisticated technological species on the planet. And then I'll talk to you about how uh, ant colonies work, how they organize themselves. Um, it's one of my uh, interests. Uh, so if you're interested in organization of ants uh, and colonies, uh, come to the live lecture on Thursday. Any other questions or comments before I take off? What, what, what time do you do? I think there's a few listings. Is it both classes or? Yeah, all three of the classes on Thursday will be the, uh, I'll be doing the same lecture. So if, if you can go to any of those classes, uh, you get some extra credit for showing up to those classes and signing in. Is there enough room when you go? Like, is oh, you yeah. Just, your seats are... Yeah, none of the classes are full. All right. All right, yeah, uh, some people are sending me emails. Good. Uh, if you have any other questions, send me an email or uh, leave a comment on the discussion forum. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, the great conversation today. I'll see you all. Right, thank you. I'll see you later, Professor. Yeah, take care.